What I share has been gathered from a great deal of reading, and I've got to be truthful, I've borrowed a lot, and it's also from 30 years of ministry for the Lord. And if you want to turn, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just a couple of verses from there. Verses 6 and 7. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. I hope you don't mind this morning, but I want to focus on you and me. All right, I'm talking to you and me this morning. That's the focus. And that what I'm trying to say to you is that I want to talk to the believer. Our life is like an empty clay jar. And the, the word for clay jar, or clay pot, is ostrakinos, which really literally means earthenware. It was a word used to describe plain, ordinary, run-of-the-mill pots. Not a very complimentary term, but it's a good analogy of our lives because the Bible says in Genesis 2 that when God made man, he formed him out of the dirt or the clay of the ground. And there are many other references in the Bible that speak of God as the master potter and we are the clay. Isaiah 64, you'll all know this. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Friends, because we have all being hand thrown by the master potter then we're all going to be different hallelujah for that what a terrible thought that must be for you to have two Keiths and I can think of some others that I wouldn't have seen duplicated either I'm looking at one of them but never mind alright but we're all different and it's true to say that because we have spent time in the world our lives can be flawed and cracked. Like clay pots in the Old Testament were just baked. Dare I say half baked some. <laughs> Turn to your neighbour and say this, I'm clay, but that's okay, God can use clay pots. Now let me give you another verse. John 8. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So I'm going to tell you the truth, so that you can be free. God didn't create you and me to be a decoration. He created you to contain something valuable. You see, a pot or a vessel is designed and created to hold something. It's not just to be an object in itself. Consider for a moment the pots you've got in your kitchen. As long as they sit there empty, they aren't really fulfilling the reason that they were made. A pot really doesn't truly become a pot until it's holding something. And in the same way, our lives are a contradiction. Until we understand that God created us to contain something, we're not complete. Let me put it bluntly. Until we contain something, we're not going to be much use to God. God doesn't need any more decorative pots. He's got churches full of them. And he doesn't need any more. And here's the good news. It doesn't matter if you're a crackpot. 
or even if you've got a blemish. Let me take you back a moment to that scripture we shared. We're all hand thrown by the master. The master potter. So we're all different. And we have, we have because of our contact with, with the world, become flawed and cracked. How many of you know that a cracked pot reveals more of God's light than an ordinary pot? How many of you know that? You see, we read that the same God who said, let there be light at creation, is the same God who made his light shine within our hearts. A cracked pot allows more light to be seen. In order for a light to shine out of a vessel, it's got to be broken. I'll prove that to you in a moment. One may know all about the way of life, and yet never communicated light to another because that one has never been broken in the presence of God. Friends, many of us have done things in the past that we want to hide. We need even to hide them from God. It's impossible to list them all, but I share with you that blemish or that defect you are hiding can be used by God. If you've been truly broken before God, that is, you have wept in repentance at your state, and God has healed and restored you, then I'm saying to you that God can use those defects. Let me give you an example. Your blemish may be that you've used drugs. Now God can use you as a walking illustration of his healing and his restoring powers. Amen. We have one amongst us who is a wonderful demonstration of God's restoring power in man, who was on heroin for years, but God healed him, and now he is a, a man who has been used by God to build his church. Amen. So God can use those defects. Okay, let me prove that a cracked pot or a broken pot shows more light. You can either look this up now or you can take my word for it. But in Judges 6, we've got a very unlikely candidate to be a leader. His name's Gideon. <laughs> and one day the angel of the Lord appeared and said, Hi there, mighty warrior. God is with you. Gideon probably swung his head round to look to see who that angel was talking to because he couldn't possibly have been talking to him because he called him a mighty warrior. When the angel told Gideon that God was going to use him to lead the Israelites to kick out the Midianites, Gideon said, you got the wrong guy. I belong to the weakest of the 12 tribes, and my clan is the weakest of the weakest tribes. And besides that, I'm the weakest man in the whole clan, I'm the runt of the litter. And God said, well, that's great. Yeah. That's absolutely great. You're exactly the kind of person that I can use. So Gideon gathered an army of 32,000 men. And God said, oh, that's too many. If they go and win a battle, they'll think that they did it. So Gideon said, any of you guys who are afraid to go into battle, go back home. 22,000 left on the spot. And that left Gideon with 10,000. And God said to Gideon, oh, that's still far too many. They might think they're responsible for victory. Let's trim it down a bit. So Gideon told the men to go to a stream and drink water. And God said, every man who gets down and laps water on all fours like a dog, send him home. Keep the ones who kneel, use their hands to drink. 9,700 of the soldiers lapped the water, leaving Gideon with 300. God said, now that's a great number. This way, when you win against overpowering odds, everyone will know it's by my power. So as God directed, Gideon's band waited until midnight and quietly surrounded the camp of the Midianites. 
Every soldier was given an empty clay jar, a torch, and a trumpet. They placed the torch inside the clay jar, and at a given signal, all the soldiers blew their trumpets, smashed their jars, and shouted, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now the Midianites woke up in panic at the sound of the trumpets, the breaking glass jars, and the shouting. They were so confused that they started fighting each other. And those who weren't killed fled into the night. But what I want you to notice, that the light of the torch wasn't revealed until the clay jar was broken. That's what God wants to do. He wants to let his, shine, his light shine through you and I. And God delights to use broken, flawed, cracked pots so that he and he alone will get the glory. I love the message translation of that passage I read to you. Let me read it to you. It's from the message. If you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. So if you're a cracked pot, don't despair. Because God delights to use cracked pots. J. Hudson Taylor was one of the first missionaries to take the gospel to China. Although he suffered from extremely poor health, God still used him. He was a weak man. He was plain, empty, clay jar that God filled with the treasure of Jesus Christ. Taylor once wrote, all of God's giants have been weak men who did great things for God because they reckoned on Christ living in them. Hudson Taylor was too humble to call himself a giant, but he understood the puzzling paradox that a mighty God can use broken, cracked, weak vessels. Like the clay jar that Gideon and his soldiers broke, there is a tremendous value in being broken. You and I throw things away when they're broken. But God actually cherishes broken people. God uses broken things. Jesus took five loaves from the little lad, broke them before he multiplied them. God wants to multiply your effectiveness but he can only do it when you are allowing him to break. When Mary brought the alabaster box of perfume, it was only when it was broken that the fragrance filled the house. When your life has been broken, that's when the fragrance of Christ can be detected in your life. Jesus even said, this is my body which is broken for you. So broken down crack pots, rejoice, because God uses crack pots so that he and he alone is going to get the glory. Amen. Okay, open your Bibles to Matthew 25, if you would. I'm not going to read it, but it's there for you to consult with. Verses 14 to 30, it's the story of the talents, okay? And most of you are familiar with this parable. The reality of the Christian walk is that you and I are not finished. I did tell you the other week, we'll never be finished until we step into glory. Every day there should be an ongoing change in situation with you and I. We're always being developed by God. We need to be growing. You can't stop. It's a lifelong process of becoming what Jesus wants us to be. You are what God has helped you become so far. And it's all according to the degree that you have yielded to him. Please don't wish for something else. Don't feel you've been given little or much. Realize you've been given what you've been given 
and go forward with it. I want to use this parable to deal with a number of issues to stop you and I being used by God. So let's concentrate on this one talent man for a few moments. Why did he do what he did? Why did he go bury what he was given? Well, I tell you, my understanding is that he did it because he felt inferior. When you were rubbing shoulders with five talent people and two talent people, and you watch them rubbing shoulders together and with, and with other similar people, then you look at yourself and it's so easy to begin to feel inferior. When you see people doing things with grace and ease and you're struggling just to function, it's easy to identify yourself as a one-talent person. And most of us would probably put ourselves in that category. There was nothing really special about the one-talent man. He didn't stand out in a crowd. He was just average. He felt inferior. Now let me repeat the scripture to you. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. This is a truth that you might not have taken hold of. To God, you are special. Each and every one of you. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, I'm special to God. I shared earlier about Gideon. He probably, out of the whole Bible, had the biggest inferior, inferiority complex you can find. He literally saw himself as a nothing. Probably the world saw him as a nothing. Yet God sent an angel to say, Hi there, mighty warrior. God is with you. You see, you and I need to wake up and learn God doesn't see things how you and I see them. He doesn't judge like the world. I've shared this many times, but it's worth sharing again. To God, you are special. To God, you're precious. You are a child of God purchased through the blood of his son, Jesus. God has accomplished a number of miracles in your life to bring you this far. Did you know that? The miracle of salvation. The miracle of being born again. The miracle of being filled with this. Do you want me to go on? They're all miracles. Yeah. You are a kingdom of God. How many of you know that? Because the kingdom of God is within you. So you are a kingdom of God. How many of you know that your, your name is in the Lamb's book of life? Which means that you are not a nobody, but you are a somebody. And if you, see, if you see yourself as being inferior, then you need to deal with the enemy who's put this cloak over you. It's a cloak of lies. Your inferiority is a fabric of woven lies by the enemy. And it's time to remove this negative cloak and you've got the power to do it. You've got the name of Jesus Christ. And you've got the power of the blood. Stand and take authority over the enemy. Break the web of lies he has surrounded you with. Equally, you will have to choose to walk a new path. Rejecting all the old inferior paths. And walk the path of the king of, the, well, a king's kid. Because if you continue to walk the old path, it's an invitation to Satan to take you back into the old ways. Equally, as we read this parable, we discover that Jesus tells us that the man was afraid. He was afraid because he has analyzed the master as being a hard person. You see, he didn't understand the master. Now, God has got expectations. There's no question about that. But God is not hard. God is gentle. God is understanding. 
God is forgiving, God is merciful. This man didn't understand the master. Therefore he's afraid and he goes and buries the talent. Another word for afraid would be fear. Again I have to say that many of God's children are unable to be used by him because they're full of fear. Fear is from the enemy. It's one of his great weapons. I need to spell this out. Whose voice are you listening to? God or Satan? The word of God states, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Or do you listen to Satan saying you can't, you'll fail, or you're not good enough. Friends, I was reminded this week that what we say we are, we become. Can I say that again to you? What we say we are, we become. If you keep saying, I can't, I'm not good enough, that's going to become your testimony. Satan will only be too willing to oblige you to get you to live it. So come on church, it's time to change your confession. Make it positive. When I came to Trinity, there were some, I was talking to Jeanette this morning about this, when I came to Trinity, there were some who wanted to bury our only talent. We were a one talent church, all right? And they wanted to bury it. They had all had reasons, but most of them were just frightened of change. They didn't want to change. But I'm convinced that if we buried our talent, the church would have remained a one talent church. And like thousands of other one talent church, across the land, I think it would have been closed by now. But hallelujah, we took our talent and we invested it and God has given us more. And he has not stopped because he honors faith. And can I give you some news? As far as Trinity is concerned, the best is yet to come. I'm convinced that is the way that God works. If you be faithful in investing the talent he has given to you, he will entrust you with more. I learned that years ago in ministry, that if I didn't use what God gave me, it slowly disappeared. But if I stretched myself and began to use what God gave me, then God gave me more. I remember the first time I made an altar call and about 40 people got out of their church and came across the front of the church. It frightened me to death. (laughs) I'm out the front yet on my own and all these people got up. I was was expecting one or two to be out the front. And about 40 people came up. So I quickly said a little prayer to the Lord. But then I began to use what God had given me, the Holy Spirit. And hallelujah, we had a wonderful evening. What a night that was. But you've got to use what God has given you. You see, there are thousands of Christians who reach a level of maturity in their Christian faith and then they become self-satisfied and complacent. They decide they don't need to grow anymore They don't need to pray anymore. They don't even need to study anymore. And the next thing you know, they start dying spiritually because they've buried their talents. All the way through scripture, Jesus is constantly challenging us to invest, to reinvest again and again in the kingdom. And he will always honor the investment. He would never honor those who are afraid or who bury their talents in the backyard. Okay, let me come back to that scripture we started with, 2 Corinthians. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay 
to show that this is all surpassing power is from God and not from us. I wonder how many of you have examined yourself to find out what treasure God has put within you. Please don't come to me and say, I have no treasure, because that means you're contradicting the word of God. Now, without repeating an old sermon, let me remind you that within every born-again, spirit-filled Christian, there are at least four things. Did you know that? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 is quite clear about it. These three things remain, faith, hope, and love, or charity, for those still using the King James. But there's another one. The fourth thing is what Paul shared in verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who makes the difference. His presence is what transforms us to become the greatest treasure of all of Jesus. I end with a story. There was a Hindu trader in India and he once came up to a missionary and he said, what do you put on your face to make it shine? And we're surprised the man of God answered, I don't put anything on it. But the Hindu began to lose patience and said, yes you do. All of you who believe in Jesus seem to have it. I've seen it in towns of Agra and Surat, even in the city of Bombay. And suddenly the Christian understood and his face glowed even more. Now I know what you mean and I'll tell you the secret. It's not something we put on from the outside. It's something that comes from within. It's the reflection of the light of God which is in our hearts. And the missionary was successful in leading that trader from being a Hindu to becoming a Christian. And Jesus showed through. So I ask you a question. Is Jesus shining out of your hearts this morning? Stop looking at yourself as a crackpot. Yeah, you might be a crackpot along with me, but God could use you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship group.